According to the Center for Disease Control, I have read that most adults don't eat all that well. Well, I, I didn't have to read that to know that's true. And it isn't necessarily because they can't, but because most adults choose not to eat well. In fact, the Center reported some time ago that only one out of 10 adults get enough servings of fruit in a typical day. And I gotta admit to you, beloved, if I'm given the choice between a banana and a chocolate covered donut, well, you can you can keep the banana. Well, now the Bible doesn't tell us how much fruit we ought to eat, although there's there's no doubt we probably ought to eat more of it, and and I ought to eat less uh, donuts. But the Bible does tell us there is something very important about a certain kind of fruit that should be a big part of our lives every single day, and it happens to be spiritual fruit. Now we don't eat this fruit. We reproduce it. We are to bear it. Uh, the Spirit of God is actually producing it in our lives. Well, as we set sail today back in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul talks about this very issue. He wrote earlier, we looked at this verse, but let me read it again. Verse 4 says, We belong to another, that is Christ, who's been raised from the dead. Now get this, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Now, as we learned in our last uh, wisdom journey, all believers have been married to Christ. We're his bride. The church is called the bride of Christ. And now we effectively reproduce, as it were, the fruit of our union with Christ. It's spiritual fruit for the glory of God. Well, now let's pick it back up here in verse 5 where we left off. Paul makes it clear that apart from Christ, no one can produce spiritual fruit. He writes here, for while we were living in the flesh... Our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members, our bodies, to bear fruit for death. Well, that's another way of saying without Christ, we can't reproduce the life of Christ. Uh, unbelievers can only produce ceremonies or, or religious rituals, pilgrimages, festivals, traditions. Paul says that's living according to the flesh. No matter how hard the flesh tries, it can't produce something genuinely spiritual, something that leads to spiritual life. Well, all that's only going to lead to, to, to death. So what does genuine spiritual fruit look like? Well, I mentioned again in our last session, the fruit of godly speech, the fruit of sacrificial giving. Well, today I want to point out some more fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in a believer's life, where the, the, the believer is effectively reproducing the character of Christ, called here by Paul, spiritual fruit. Uh, we'll call the next one the fruit of clean conduct. And again, this is a desire of our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, for us, his bride. He, he, he wants us to live clean lives. Now that process begins at salvation. It continues all the way until the day it's completed, by the way, which is at the day of his appearing. So we're never going to perfectly arrive, beloved. Keep in mind, the Lord isn't going to finish the job until he glorifies you with a new body that no longer has a fallen nature. Paul writes that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Another fruit we're to reflect in our lives is, is really a, a new set, as it were, of godly passions. Now, this brings us back to verses 5 and 6, where Paul makes a contrast between how we lived as unbelievers and how we're to live now. He writes here in verse 5, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in this new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now, Paul's point here, which extends back into chapter 6, is that in Christ, we're no longer under the law. We've been released from the law. We've been joined to Christ. Now, this doesn't mean we're free to run around sinning. 
you know, doing anything we want as we please. It means we're free to serve our new master, what would please the Lord Jesus. And those who are serving their new master, well, let me tell you, they act like it. So what's the fruit of that relationship? Well, Paul answers that over in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. By the way, that, that list isn't called the fruits of the Spirit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. God isn't isn't producing the fruit of love in some believers over here and the fruit of patience in some believers, you know, over there and the fruit of kindness in a few believers over, over here. No, it's all one fruit with different aspects. Keep in mind then that this leaves no room for, you know, self-congratulations or self-pride. In fact, we ought to correct our theological vocabulary. You know, we often say something like, well, that sister in Christ over there, well, she sure is a peaceful Christian. Or, or that, that brother in Christ over there, he just seems to be joyful. <laughs> no, the truth is they, they aren't peaceful or joyful in and of themselves. They are simply responding to the, the Spirit of God whose joy and peace is evident in their lives. They're bearing it out in their conduct and character. That's why this is called the fruit of the Spirit. It isn't called the fruit of Stephen or the fruit of Susan. It's the reproduction of Christ's character as believers submit to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's another mistaken notion in the church today, and, and that's the idea that we're going to get patience down perfectly, and then we're going to move on to, to goodness. And then once we've got goodness mastered, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to joy and, and then maybe on to love. Uh, no, beloved, there, there's just one fruit with many expressions. It isn't like individual apples on a limb. This is more like grapes in one cluster. So if the Spirit of God is in control of a believer's life, it's going to be evidenced in these areas of life. Now, obviously, certain qualities of conduct and character are going to be more evident uh, than others at times. But the truth remains. Bearing fruit is not so much a list of rules to follow as it is a relationship with the Lord. It's a, it's a submission to the Spirit of God who develops this fruit in us that we then bear in our lives. I remember reading that it was Alexander Graham Bell who advised the parents of a little girl named Helen to send for a teacher from the Perkins Institution for the Blind in Boston, Massachusetts. Well, that teacher was Ann Sullivan. She was a 19-year-old orphan and she was chosen for the task of teaching that little six-year-old blind, deaf, and mute girl named Helen Keller. After weeks of hard work, Anne was finally able to connect the letters that she pressed into Helen's hand with actual objects. Within two years, Helen was reading and writing Braille fluently. At age 10, Helen learned different sounds by placing her fingers on her teacher's throat feeling the vibrations, and literally learning how to talk. Later, Helen went to college. Anne went along with her, spelled every single lecture into Helen's hand. Their nearly 50 years of companionship ended when Anne died in 1936. Helen wrote these endearing words about her lifelong friend who'd become her eyes, her ears, and her mouth. She wrote this, my teacher is so near to me that I scarcely think of myself apart from her. I feel that her being is inseparable from my own and that the footsteps of my life are in hers. All the best of me belongs to her. There's not a talent or an inspiration or a joy in me that has not been awakened by her loving touch. After reading that, I couldn't help but think, beloved, that what Ann Sullivan was to Helen Keller, the Spirit of God is to us, to every believer. Uh, the Holy Spirit touches, as it were, our eyes, our mouths, our ears, our hands, our, our hearts. He, he's our inseparable tutor, friend. He, he's so near to us. Well, he indwells us that we can't think of ourselves apart. From him. So today, 
Let's ask God's Spirit to reproduce in us so that we can bear for others to see the fruit of our relationship with Him and as we walk with Him today. Well, until next time, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.